The people now called Negroes are the most powerful and the least understood of the world's people. This term, Negro, demoralizes us and is it detrimental. I feel that it doesn't give us, give us any association past the slave ship. I think that the first task of uh, people of African descent, whether in the United States or in Africa or elsewhere, is to get rid of this slave named Negro. Uh, this curious word, Negro, uh, was seldom or never used in Africa itself. And this word has no meaning or no worthwhile meaning at all in Africa. I would doubt myself if it has any useful meaning anywhere else. What is a Negro? A simple question. But the answer is not so simple. My name is Ossie Davis. I'm an actor and a writer, and the narrator of our series of programs on the history of the Negro people. I'm also a Negro. What is a Negro? In Africa, the word Negro has no meaning. In Brazil, a Negro is a man who's very poor and very black. And in the United States, a man who has any quantity of Negro blood, or whatever that is, is considered a Negro. Are Negroes a race, a people, or a condition? Our programs will be asking this question in many ways and in many different settings. Our odyssey will take us throughout the world to Africa, where we will explore the relationship of American Negroes to the land of their origin, to Brazil, where we will ask, is Brazil a racial paradise? And throughout the United States. Our aim in this series is both a modest and an ambitious one. We will be asking many questions and perhaps answer only a few. For there is a vast ignorance of Negro history among whites and Negroes. And the job of filling this vacuum is massive. Do Negroes have a heritage and a tradition like the Greeks, the French, the Anglo-Saxons? Or are we something less as others have portrayed us? Everywhere we have looked, we have seen Negroes as savage and barbaric, humble and self-sacrificing scared and childish and inferior. And I remember as a kid coming from some of the pictures and we spent the whole time from the, from the motion picture house to home uh, satirizing the Negro performances we saw in the film. Well, it was also an admission that somehow or other this was to some degree what we were. Now these, these important and very, very uh, impressionistic things that we got from these films did, to some degree, govern our behavior. When a Negro child goes into a movie, for instance, and sees himself or sees another Negro in an unfavorable light, he, he, he feels, to some degree, threatened. He feels uncomfortable. And a great deal of his laughing at that uh, situation will be the kind of laughter that protects him. It's a, it's a nervous attack against him, his self, uh, the way he looks at himself, the esteem with which he holds himself and uh, how he will rate with his fellows in the streets. You know, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's seeing something happen to you that you can't control, which leaves a scar, which leaves you feeling inadequate. You know, you don't feel loved. You're ashamed to look at yourself, ashamed to go home, ashamed to talk to the boys next door, ashamed even to ask these questions of your parents, although sometimes you do. It's a horrible situation and sometimes we never get over that. As a Negro, I have honestly tried to believe that I was somebody. And I've always fought during my life to keep that feeling that I did have some value. And I say value knowing what that word means. And 
There's been many a night in my life when I went to sleep and known very deep inside me that I really wasn't worth much. I still do not really know what being a Negro is or what it means. It means that my skin is a little bit darker. It means that my cultural exposures have been somewhat different to other ethnic groups. It may even mean that as a human being, I might be more sensitive to need and despair. Oh, yes, uh, you know, that wish I was white kind of thing, when you begin to sort of uh, get the feeling of uh, difference, like maybe you're dirty or something's wrong. But there was that feeling, you know, so early you can't even remember where it started. No, I'm not over it yet. Uh, it's part of my American heritage. We were told we were a people without a past and without a future. And Negro boys and girls learned before very long that they were something special. You know, at an early age, as soon as you start school, you begin to catch on to the whole racial thing. But uh, once you get into school, you begin to know it and know there's a difference and that the difference is against you. There's no real reference to me as a Negro or to my father or any of the other Negroes who have contributed so much to the growth of the United States. And I, I, I really can't understand it. I'll never forget the picture in the geography book of a couple of very uh, ragged Africans, you know. Weeks before we got to the lesson, we were stealing ourselves for it. Uh, some Negro child would find the picture first in the book before we got to the lesson and alert everyone. Look on page 22, you see what's there. And then we dreaded reaching that lesson because it was always something about the savages not knowing anything. And we had to sit there and hear this and instinctively the white children would turn and look at the Negro children, you know, while this lesson was going on. And so Africa became our shame and our torment. We were told that our past was barbarism and the white man our redeemer. Slavery was a sin, but salvation. Few of us had anything to look forward to. We were afraid to look back. In 1958, Lorraine Hansberry wrote a play, A Raisin in the Sun, that showed the conflicts created for American Negroes by their African past. <laughs> Well-dressed Nigerian woman would wear. Isn't that beautiful? Hey, look, honey, we're going to the theater. We're not going to be in it, you know. George, I don't like that. Do you expect this boy to go out with you looking like that? Well, now that's up to George. If he's ashamed of his heritage. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Here we go again. A lecture on our African past, on our great West African heritage. In one second, you know, we're going to hear all about the great Ashanti empires, the Songhai civilizations, the, the sculpture of Benin, some poems in the Bantu, and then the whole monologue is going to end up with the word heritage. Let's face it, baby, your heritage ain't nothing but a bunch of raggedy spirituals in some grass huts. Grass huts? Oh, you see, George. You think you would rather stand there in your splendid ignorance and know absolutely nothing about the people who were the first to smell iron on the face of this earth while the Ashantis were performing surgical operations. When the English were still tattooing themselves with blue dragons. At the heritage program of How You Act, a federally sponsored effort to develop better opportunities for Harlem's Negro youth. A new version of African history is being taught. Robert Moore is a visiting lecturer. Mr. Moore, 
Do you think that the social, so-called Negro would dignify his identity by associating himself with his um, ancestral background from Africa? After some three or four hundred years of transplantation from Africa into America, it is obvious that we are not Africans anymore. We are Afro-Americans, Americans of African ancestry. And that connects us, basically, with our original heritage and culture. The accomplishments of Africa before and after... Director of the program the is John Henrik Clark. This accomplishment is generally glossed over or neglected in human history. A lot of this, the misconception of Africa and the distortion of African history is involved in a word that is relatively new, the word Negro. A kind of nickname that grew out of European laziness, the inability or the uh, lack of a desire to give Africans their proper identity. In the period when the Europeans had to justify the exploitation of Africa and the demeaning of a whole people, they systematically started the effort to read the African out of human history. A great deal of uh, ignorance of African history sits upon the old conservative racial discrimination and prejudice which we have had in Europe. Basil Davidson is a we British writer and historian on Africa. United States. It still sits upon the belief, perfectly unscientific, quite unbased in any uh, scholarly discipline, that the Africans, that is to say, if you like, the Negroes, are people of some sort of inferiority to others and therefore have not been able to develop in the same way. Now, you know the great myth of the colonial era, the great myth took the shape of saying that the Africans, the Negroes, uh, are children, and because they are children, it said, failing to develop, we the Europeans, you the Americans, must go in there and show them the way they should go, civilize them, introduce them to the blessings of orderly life. One of the misunderstandings you see about Africa is the apparently primitive material nature of their civilization. You look at these people living in these villages and you wonder what is their past? Do they have a past? Uh, what lies behind it all? They have nothing but a few straw buildings and nothing but a few cattle. Uh, it seems quite inconsiderable. The Dinka, for example, have no stone in their country. They have almost no metal. Half their country is underwater half the year. They cannot build and could never possibly build an imposing material civilization, but their achievement was, of course, to learn how to master their environment, and this they have done with quite outstanding success, so that the outside picture, the superficial picture, is, gives no indication at all of the depth of their culture. These are the people who have mastered the problems of taming this difficult, vast continent with all its extraordinarily great obstacles to living, its swamps, its deserts, its mountains, and its forests. The story of Africa over the last 2,000 years has been one of quite epic dimensions. Africa. Endless deserts scorching and windswept by day. Bitterly cold at night. And the Sahara the world's largest desert, a harsh, bleak expanse of land challenging anyone to cross it. Snow-capped mountains near the equator, gigantic waterfalls, in the jungle mists and rain almost daily. These were some of the barriers to penetration. To the outside world, it was the dark continent, a land of mystery, where stories were spread of giants and dwarfs, of people whose heads grew under their arms, of monstrous animals.
It is here, in this forbidding other world, that what may be the remains of the first man were discovered. In 1959, in Tanganyika, a scientific expedition had been digging for weeks in the sun-baked earth, looking for traces of the earliest man. Then, in July, Dr. Lewis Lakey and his team found what he called Zenjanthropus, nicknamed the Nutcracker Man because of the strength of his jaws. He was about 600,000 years old, and maybe the creature that makes Africa the real cradle of mankind. The records of ancient Africa begin with Egypt, about 3000 BC. Its spectacular achievements of the monumental pyramid and brooding sphinx have always been credited to Asia and the Mediterranean. But there is growing evidence that Egypt owes more than originally thought to the land to the south, Kush, the land of the Negroes. About 700 BC, Kushite kings conquer Egypt and become the 25th dynasty. Little is known today about the land of Kush, but in the ancient world, it was highly respected. In 1791, the French philosopher Count de Valne wrote of the Kushites, a people now forgotten, discovered while others were yet barbarians, the elements of arts and the sciences. Then, in about 325 AD, Kush is attacked and destroyed and disappears from our view. For the rest of Africa, there is little we can say for certain. Except for the Kushites, Africans had no writing. They kept in their memories the history of their people. Stories narrated down from generation to generation. This oral tradition must tell us much of the history that will fill the gaps in our knowledge. In the Western Sudan, Negro kingdoms arise in the medieval periods of walled and fortified cities, markets, and fairs. Ghana is the earliest of these civilizations, going back to 300 AD. In the 8th century, an Arab writer tells us that the Arabs sent an expedition to this pagan land of gold. African markets, the main source of gold before the discovery of America. Then, about 1067, Arabs from the north, fired by their new faith, storm into the western Sudan. fighting, the Arabs conquer Ghana and settle there. From this time on, trans-Saharan caravan trade flourishes. And with the trade comes Islam. Islam spreads through West Africa. When Europe was going through a so-called dark ages, Muslim culture is the main advancement of human knowledge. Most important of all, a written language comes to the Western Sudan. Almost all that we know about these kingdoms was preserved for us by Arab and Negro scholars of that time. Around the 12th century, Ghana gives way to the empire of Mali. In 1324, King Mansa Musa makes a pilgrimage to Mecca with a caravan of 60,000 people. 
An Arab traveler arriving in Mali in 1353 wrote, the Negroes have a greater abhorrence of injustice than any other people. Neither traveler nor inhabitant of this land has anything to fear from robbers or men of violence. Could the same be said of the 14th century England or France? The kingdom of Songhai, most famous for its university, the fabled Timbuktu. Students and scholars from all over the world came here to study. A Moorish traveler wrote, more profit is made from the book trade than from all other branches of commerce. If we ask ourselves a little more nearly, what have been the uh, cultural contributions of African peoples to the rest of the world, then of course we are faced immediately with the remarkably original and outstanding quality of their plastic arts. The most important art in Africa has, of course, been dancing. And dancing has passed into the folklore of the whole of the rest of the world uh, from its African origins. If you go to places like Brazil or the West Indies or the southern United States, you will find African dances still being danced there, though, of course, in different circumstances and therefore in somewhat different ways. But the whole concept of rhythm as being an expression of the personality and not simply a wiggling of the body. And a wiggling of the body is all that most Europeans can achieve. But an expression of the personality, this comes from the African concept of dancing. More obvious is the tradition of plastic art. A large number of African peoples have developed forms of sculpture in wood, or in stone, or in ivory, or in brass, or bronze, or iron, or gold, which are of great effectiveness and great originality. And this too, of course, is passed into the general Western tradition of uh, pictorial art, and to some extent of plastic art as well. The remarkable art of Benin and Ife. The bronzes of Benin were said to be worthy of Cellini. Europe was amazed at the discovery that Africans could perform such an impressive creation of bronze casting. African sculpture burst upon the European art world. It became a major influence in the modern movement. Picasso, Brock, Modigliani, Leger, Deron found in African sculpture a freedom and a vitality they had been searching for. Here was no slavish imitation of nature, something the camera could do better, but a new and fresh way of looking at the world behind the appearance. We have only skimmed the surface of the history of African civilizations, and there are wide gaps in our knowledge. Among the riddles of ancient Africa are where did the Negro come from? What happened to the Kushites after their defeat? Where did the sculptors of Benin learn their remarkable skills? We haven't even begun to penetrate some of these mysteries. Yet, growing knowledge and interest in Africa is rediscovering a world we never knew. And many Negroes are examining for the first time the values that were lost. My name is Yula Missy, and I'm addressing my question to Mr. Carr. I want to know what happened to the so-called Negro culture in America. The most tragic destruction of African culture was the destruction of the African culture brought to these shores, brought to American shores. Now, the first thing they did was to forbid the drum, forbid all African ceremonies, forbid African ornaments, literally to destroy a people in such a manner that they had to be remade in an American image. This was not exactly true in the West Indies. It was slavery, make no mistake about it. But because it was only in Ireland many of the Africans could communicate 
with each other and maintain some of the African culture, while in the United States it was impossible because as they arrived, mother, brother, sister were split up and they went in opposite directions. Then they were resold. They might have been resold within a matter of days after they were sold the last time. So it was difficult for relatives to keep track of each other. And it was difficult for a continuity to be maintained in, in African culture. This was the beginning of the fragmenting of our family in this country. It was also the beginning of the demeaning and the uh, sub negation of the masculinity of the black male in America. This demeaning of our culture and this reading us out of the commentary of human history has left deep psychological scars. What we are trying to do now is a massive job of rebuilding the inside, the spirits, the hopes, the history, the culture of a people. We're trying to restore those values that have been taken away. And we're trying to get across to black youth that they have a part to play in the making of a new world. They have the imagination, they have the energy. You must first restore that part of yourself that has been negated by oppression. It is as, it's as essential to you as bread and water. It is part of the food that must feed your spirit in the world of tomorrow. And it is part of what you will have to transfer to your children.